This is Death in Ice Valley, an original podcast series from the BBC World Service and NRK. We now know the Istal woman's age has placed her in a different period than the one we first thought. Her childhood belongs to the interwar years, with the clouds of conflict gathering on the horizon. A place and time where people could be lost, found or changed forever. I'm Marie Tegerov. And I'm Neil McCarthy. And this is episode nine, The Istal Girl. So, Marit, I'm hoping we're taking a step forward here. Uh, we're on a night flight from London to Nuremberg in the southeast corner of Germany. The reason we're going to Nuremberg is because the isotope analysis of the teeth show there's a number of red spots where we know the Istal woman was as a very young girl and then later on as a teenager. And the first red spot is Nuremberg. Nuremberg is really a red hot spot on the European map that she most certainly was born and spent her first living years in Nuremberg. It's not much to see out of the window, it's just black, black, black. We just passed Belgium. Yeah. So we we are over German area now. This is quite a good time in our story, isn't it? We're moving to a different geographical space. We're going into Europe, into deeper Europe, into the beginning of her story, of her life story. Yeah, and I, I think the exciting thing about this trip we're doing now, I have a strong feeling we're really going into the most interesting area for us now. Germany, France, Belgium, Luxembourg, that's the area we assume are the most interesting countries for us. shot in a way this journey we're making now because we don't have a name we don't know where to search exactly so we're doing what the isotope maps are telling us to we're going to those places where she most probably lived We're in Nuremberg in the late 1920s and 30s, and we assumed that the Easter woman was as a child. You were in the spiritual heart of Nazi Germany, and you would have seen Adolf Hitler's rise to power close up. Propaganda rallies of hundreds of thousands of military and civilian Nazi party supporters filled the Zeppelin fields during the famous Nuremberg rallies. Grandstand built in the image of a Roman temple looks out onto a giant stadium. This is the place you can see here, a rostrum where Hitler holds his speeches. Now it's desolate and crumbling, with only passing tourists and weeds blowing across it. And this is where we meet historian from the documentation center of the Nazi party rally grounds, Dr. Alexander Schmidt. Nuremberg was the city where the biggest celebrations from the Nazi movement took place. Every year, for one week, they come together and celebrated Hitler, celebrated Germany, and wanted to show the whole world how strong Germany now is. It was a propaganda show. And Nuremberg was the most important city for the Nazi movement. The medieval city, the old city, was a symbol for the typical Germany. And there was the celebration in uniform that 
Hitler was the top and they will follow him. And he talked a lot about one Germany and one people. Yes, yes, he said, we are one German community who goes in one direction and I'm in front and I will show you where to go. He means, he knows that this would be a war, but he never said that. Certain groups had no place in Hitler's ideology of one German community, most notably the Jews, who were subjected first to harassment and attack and were then victims of genocide as the Second World War unfolded and approximately six million Jews were murdered. Because of where she came from, but more importantly, because she moved away from here in her youth. One theory we've considered is that the Esau woman could have been Jewish and fled Nuremberg in the 1930s. This has also been a topic of discussion in our Facebook group. We're going to follow this line of inquiry for now to see where it leads. We were wondering, with this rise of Nazism, how quickly the Jews would have been leaving Nuremberg. It depends of their hopes and their thinking. Some of the Jewish people thought, we are Germans too. For example, we have been in the First World War as a soldier. They didn't leave. They are waiting. And this was their problem in the late 30s. Others who I spoke to one Jewish man for years and he said, I uh, look outside of my window and saw the big marches to the Zeppelin field. And this was the moment I know I have to go. And you can feel it in Nuremberg, not so much other cities, that the Nazi movement will have a future and a Jewish people in Germany will have not. So this is uh, one connection. If she was in Nuremberg, she has a chance to see how strong the Nazi movement is and that a Jewish young girl will have not a good future in such a city. So if she was Jewish, her parents would have been looking for an escape plan. Daniela Eisenstein is the director of the Jewish Museum in Nuremberg. Jews had been in the city for centuries and were highly integrated. By the 1930s, anti-Semitism was on the rise, encouraged by Nazi ideology. There were waves of attacks on Jews and their properties at the time the Istal woman would have been a young girl. So many families decided to try and get their kids on a so-called Kindertransport in November, and they left from Prague, went over Nuremberg to Holland, and from Holland to England. Up to 10,000 children from Germany, from former Czechoslovakia, parts of Poland and Holland were able to survive via the Kindertransport. Then, of course, there were these clandestine operations where Catholics all over Europe tried to hide children in monasteries. But it could have just been parents sending their children to uh, relatives that lived westward. Those are the possibilities that uh, may have an answer for you who this person could have been. Now, non-Jewish families sent their children away when the bombings began after the outbreak of the Second World War, starting in 1940. But these children were sent to the countryside in Bavaria, to former Prussia, to uh, Bohemia, Moravia, or Austria, but not really westward exactly the the other direction. So whether or not she was Jewish, there were different reasons to be leaving Nuremberg at that time. The isotope science shows us quite a few areas where she might have gone next, and they are mostly in the western part of Europe. And if the Istal woman was Jewish and she was evacuated, she would have gone westward. Rudy Seslansky, now in his 80s, was born around the same time as her in Nuremberg. This is his story as a child. Could it have been similar to hers? Uh, My earliest memories go back to when I was maybe between three and four years old, when there was a loud banging on our street door, and my father got up, went to the door, and suddenly there were five or six men standing in the room wearing long 
black coats. They started opening all the drawers. They opened the cupboards. I uh, was just wondering why they were doing that. Apparently they were looking for money or for jewelry. They didn't find very much in our place. They came to our house because we were Jewish. After this event, I still remember hearing my parents talking about me, what they should do to save my life. Like many Jewish children, Rudy was put on the kinder transport out of Nazi Germany. It was an organised evacuation to a safer haven in Britain between 1938 and 1940. My parents took me to a railway station and I remember my mother saying, Rudy, you go ahead, we'll be with you again in three weeks' time. In other words, my parents also wanted to leave the country. And then came the day when I had to leave my parents. And I remember being amongst very many other children. They took us by train to Holland. And from Holland, we went on a boat to Harwich. And from Harwich, on a train to London. For me, that was a terrible time because it was only a couple of days later that we were on the 1st of September, 1939, when the war broke out. On that day, I realised that my parents would be stopped from leaving Germany and I was scared. And it was seven years I knew nothing about my parents. I didn't know what was happening to them. And, of course, they didn't know what was happening with me. Rudy's story is typical of a young child on the kindertransport, quickly evacuated, not knowing what happened to their parents separated for the duration of the war, or permanently, as many Jewish adults were murdered in Nazi concentration camps. Germany divided after the war into capitalist West and communist East. If the Istal woman was reported missing in the East, which was under Communist Party rule, it's unlikely that the Norwegian police or Interpol would ever have known about that. So, Andreas, you film how they interact, how they mm. discuss the next day, what are we going to do? Now we've come to what we believe to be the part of the world she grew up in. We wanted to reach into people's homes with her story. A German TV and radio crew has been following us around whilst we make our inquiries, filming and recording us, helping us get the word out to somebody who might remember her. The story about that woman, uh, nobody knows who she was and... It's uh, very interesting for our viewers to hear that she was uh, German, apparently. She had maybe German sisters or brothers and parents or a nephew who remembers her or who remembers, ah, back in the days there was this aunt of my father that never came back or something like that. I think people love these stories and, uh, yeah, maybe someone remembers something. Claudia Kafanke is a TV reporter from Südwestdeutsche Rundfunk, SWR, one of Germany's biggest broadcasters. I think for the people it's almost emotional a little. I mean, if she was really German, she, if she was one of us, it's really like, yeah, you want to know who was she and how did she end up there? And from a very interesting time in German history, the decades leading up to 1970, a divided country, mm -hmm. people were lost on either side to each other's families and some were reunited, some weren't. This is part of what I've been thinking is that did she, she sort of lost touch with her relatives or was caught on the wrong side of the border at one point? It's all speculation, but it, in the course of history, it's quite possible. Absolutely, yes, because there was so many people without roots and without families, as you said, and maybe 
some uh, difficulties in between political discussions in the families. You know, you have all these divided people back then. So you probably she said, oh, go to hell, Dad, I leave you, because we had the wrong political view or whatever. So everything could be possible. But yeah, a lot of uh, families has been divided back then. And what's good for us is that the cutting edge of science has brought us here. But now it's over to human memory. It's always going to be the two things that will help solve this mystery. came on quite a long road trip from Nuremberg and we're following the isotope map really. We've been through forests and hills and pine trees and silver birch and we've come quite high up into the Fals region. Marit? Yeah, it's in the southwest of Germany and you're right, the isotope map showed us the possibility that our woman, the East Star woman, actually moved here to this region. It could at least be one of some possibilities in this area. And so where we are, we're quite high up, surrounded by open farmland. We've been through vineyards. There's a very old church to my right, an old sandstone church. And um, to tell us a little bit more about where we are is Mr. Dully, a lay preacher here at Maria Rosenberg. Maria Rosenberg is a pilgrim shrine of our Holy Mother Maria. The first part of the chapel was built in 1150, and since this time, uh, people are coming here to pray, to enjoy the silence. And as well as being a, a church, it's also a place where children have lived, especially in the 20th century, haven't they? Yes. We have here a home for children who don't have parents. Uh, it was built in 1928. They lived uh, in the former times uh, only women, young women and girls who uh, don't have parents, who came out from uh, um, difficult uh, families, yes. So like a foster home for children. And so we're interested because at uh, the period we're looking at during the war, Second World War, it shows on the isotope map that the Istal woman as a teenager might have been in this area. Perhaps she was in a foster home, or perhaps she was somewhere like this. So I understand you have an archive. Yes. <laughs> So we'd like to see it, please. I showed you. We're going now in the Stifterhaus. And this was the first home for the young girls because the other house was built in 1928. And it's called the Stifterhaus. So the girls would have lived above us because we're down in the basement. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So we go left up to the steps. And so we have uh, our little archive. Yes. Uh, yeah, here's the archive. Archive. Filled with uh, plenty of binders and files and handwritten documents. We have here documents from this home, from when it was built, and, and some documents, some letters. There we have a uh, contact to Nuremberg. Oh, you do? It's here. Look at this. This is a cardboard file, uh, Hitler's Zeit, 1933 to 1945. It's the time of Adolf Hitler. And this is our director, Mood. He called Johannes Mood. Collects these documents in this map here. They have letters from 1935. Yeah, and here it's called Der Stadtrat von Nürnberg. Oh. It's a letter from the, from, uh, the Jugendamt, from the Office for the Young People from 35, And it's called uh, Vollzug der Fürsorgeerziehung. Children in the Nuremberg area that were being taken care of. Yeah, 
It could be that the children from Nuremberg or from the area Bavaria were here in this time. Could it be that there are name lists that you have? In some documents we find names, but a list of every year we, we don't, we, we have no. Is it possible? Could I have a look? Yes, we can have a look. Oh, thank you. Right. And there we could have, could have names. Laub, Beusch, Steinbrecher, Wagner. Braun, Schwendner. Oh, here's one. Mm -hmm. Very close. It's one with the surname Thiel. Mm. T H I E L. Yes. It's almost Thiel. Almost one. Claudia Thiel. Yeah. We just need a name. A real name. Claudia Thiel, you'll remember, was one of the Eastall woman's identities. It was very tantalising looking at the records and the photos, but there were no complete registers of girls sent from Nuremberg to the Maria Rosenberg school. So we couldn't follow up any specific names and addresses. Also joining us in the archive at Maria Rosenberg is Dr. Richard Antoni, who has studied the history of the school in a bit more depth. Das Heim hatte eigentlich hier einen guten Ruf, war angelegt für... He's telling about what kind of children stayed here before and during the World War. And it was mostly children with behavioral problems. Mm -hmm. They were sent here, the parents needed help and so on. They, for instance, came from Nuremberg area. Nein, glaube ich nicht. He is not believing that there were Jewish children hidden here for the war because there were too many people here. There were also soldiers here, so it was much too dangerous for the director to do a thing like that because he would then probably be sent to a, a camp. And he had the responsibility for so many children here, so he wouldn't have dared doing that, he says. Not a likely place for her to have stayed if she was Jewish. But what about the surrounding area? There is one more person to see in this southwestern corner of Germany before we leave. We'd heard rumours that the church hid Jewish children in this border region between Germany and France. Roland Paul is historian of the Falls region. Maybe the profession of the father, you know, maybe he got a job here. Then the family moved to here. This often happened. People came here and, and got a job. But in the 30s, if they were Jews, they had a hard time, you know that. And they, they often left then, you know. In Nuremberg, the persecution was very strong. So maybe this family had relatives here who invited them to come. This was, would be a possibility. I wouldn't know if any monasteries would help Jews. There were a few ministers or a few families who helped Jewish people here. But this area was a center of the Reformation already in the 16th century. So all the monasteries which once existed here, they disappeared very early in history already. If she did come from a Jewish family and she moved to this area, up to what point would it have been safe to be in this region? You could say it was really safe between 33 and 38. After 38, it was very severe, the persecution. After the Crystal Night in, in November 1938, many people left in 38 and, and 39. Many people, by the way, went to France because many hoped that the Nazi period would be over soon. And then if they lived in this border area, they could have get home, come home early, you know, or, or soon or, or fast or so, not, instead of going in a other country. If she moved either forcibly or voluntarily, she would be very hard to track down, especially without a name. But listen to Professor Stephen Dorrell. He's an expert on intelligence services during the Cold War. He teaches at Huddersfield University in the UK. And he feels that a disrupted childhood like this one could have prepared the Istal girl for what was to come later in life. My thought when I was listening to this and the fact that she came from where she came from, Germany, etc., given her age, I did think maybe this is a refugee. Maybe she's lost her family. Particularly if she was Jewish, uh, she probably would have. And she would have been this single person, which is probably ideal for an intelligence agency to use. 
little or no background, you can then develop these different identities. If we are to believe the scientific evidence, it places the Eastal woman in one of the hotspots of European history. Yes, a child growing up around here at that time would have witnessed the rise of Hitler and anti-Semitism. She would have felt the full force of war as the Allies liberated Europe. Yeah, and watched as the continent was divided by the West and Soviet Union and plunged into a Cold War. We've obviously spent a lot of time trying to piece together the last days, weeks, months of her life. And now to come back to what could have been the start of her life in such a sort of fractured world of pre- and post-war Europe, there may be the seeds of these many identities that she ended up having. Because we just don't know what happened to her life then, what sort of chaos she came out of. So Marit, we've done a big tour of the south of Germany. We've been to Nuremberg, we've been to the Fals area, following the isotopes, following the possible traces of the Istal woman. And now we're at Frankfurt Airport, about to depart our separate ways. But it's been quite an interesting journey, hasn't it? It has been very interesting, although we didn't get a real answer and we didn't expect to either that we, we should get the final answer now. I mean, this trip was to try to follow in her footsteps which has been when she was a small child and we actually learned a lot Yeah, learned a lot about the sort of world she was living in in the 1920s or the 1930s, the changes that were taking place, the movements people were forced to make away from cities like Nuremberg, what life might have been like in the countryside but we're still not there yet, we've put the word out Marit Higraf, Journalistin beim norwegischen Fernsehen, hat jetzt eine erste konkrete Spur. Sie führt in die Pfalz, in die Klosteranlage Maria Rosenberg in der Nähe von Pirmasens. Weil wir vermuten, dass die Frau höchstwahrscheinlich ihre späte Kindeszeit und Jugend hier verbracht haben. Die Rechtsmedizin. It's kind of strange to listen to German radio and suddenly, yeah, I hear myself and then talking about this case and wow, it was. Big story. I, I mean, I only speak about three words of German, but you sounded great. <laughs> yeah, it's so strange to hear it myself, you know. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think it was okay. So they've spread the word. They want people to get in touch if they know anything. Oh, yes. It was really good for us, this story, saying you should take contact if you know something about the case, you know, and pointing to the next uh, program that w- is going to tell more to the viewers and listeners and also pointing out where they can send tips if they know something about our woman. I believe there's some news just in. Another clue has turned up. Yeah, it's coincident actually that we had the same thought yesterday. Me and colleague Stola, who is at home at the office, both of us were coming on the same thought yesterday about a spoon in the suitcases and the historian, the Jews we met in the Falls area. Mm-hmm. He got more enthusiastic after the interview because then he could speak in his own language, German, and he he was very fascinated by the story and, and he started asking me questions about a spoon. But we didn't pay it much attention because it didn't say much, this steel spoon, you know. But then he, again and again he asked me, but did you check that spoon? Did you check if there was something on the backside, some initials or some engraving, you know? And I said, I don't think so, because we would have seen it. But then it shows out at the backside of this spoon, there is actually an engraving. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? Yeah. There is a clue on the backside of the spoon. What is it? Letters, numbers? It's a heart. And inside the heart, there are some letters. S. C, H, then a line, and then a P. Mm, That has to stand for something. Could even be her own initials. I got a bit confused yesterday when he started asking me about the spoon, but he was very, very keen on knowing if if this spoon had some initials or something. Then he told me why, because he said some Jews sometimes bring a spoon with them because it means something special for them. 
or like some sort of connection with a former home? It could be that the spoon was given to them from a special person, the mother, or by some special occasion. Just think about that. Think about if it, this spoon meant something really special for her, and that was the reason she had it with her. Yeah, and it's the one thing that could have a, a personal connection with her life, whereas everything else seemed to be, you know, impersonal, really, or just functional. And think about that. If she really left us the one big clue and we we haven't seen it before but we have the possibility now to find out what it means can't wait to get home actually to see it myself <laughs> <laughs>